the devil we know, how Satan operates, how demons operate. We're going to look at today the levels of demonic infiltration in the lives of people as well as some of his devices that he uses to attack people and some of the ways that God brings deliverance into our life. I believe today will be the day where the Lord will bring a greater level and the measure of freedom into your life in Jesus' name. Freedom is like money, you know, the more the better and stuff. So I always tell people that we all want to be more free, more victorious in Jesus. Amen. If you agree with that, drop number one in the chat. There are four main levels of demonic influence in people's lives. The first one is when you get affected by demons. We see that Luke chapter 4 verse 38 and 39, Jesus rebuked fever out of Peter, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. So rebuking the fever, fever could tell us that maybe there had to be something demonic there. And we can all come under the effect of demonic spirits. Um, you can be walking with the Lord and come under effect of that even without leaving a door open. The same way you can come in contact with flies and with other animals that are has they're bad for you or they could attack you. And we, we can all come into that because we live in a broken world today. That's the first level is you can be affected by it. Number two is that you can get afflicted. Affliction goes a little bit deeper. This is when the enemy begins to specifically harass a particular area area of your life. Um, in Luke chapter 13 verse 16, we see that a woman was bound by a spirit of infirmity. And so people who sometimes experience particular sicknesses can actually uh, feel afflicted uh, by the enemy. Uh, feel a particular affliction in their finances, affliction in their relationship, affliction in their sleep, affliction in their mood or their mind, affliction in some of the behaviors. Number three is restricted. Restricted is when you are experiencing a certain limitation, certain hold back, something is holding you back, something is not allowing you to go forward. The Bible says that there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place and the weapons of a warfare are mighty in God. And so what happens in the spiritual realm is the enemy wants to protect his territory and he wants to hold you back from accessing everything that Jesus has for you. And the fourth uh, level, and it's the most malevolent, the most uh, dramatic one, and that is when the enemy dominates or controls a particular area of your life. And that's in Luke chapter 8 verse 27 through 31. We see that these two men were controlled by the enemy. They were dominated. Now, in Christian circles, they use the word possession. In fact, our New King James Bible talks about being possessed. But the original language seemed to indicate more of a word demonized, meaning to come under influence, to be controlled, and to be possessed not in the sense that you are owned, but possessed in the sense that you're dominated or that you are um, under heavy influence, demonization of a particular demon or particular demons. The devil's goal is to dominate us. The devil's goal is not just to affect, afflict, restrict, limit, but to bind and to dominate and to control, to live our life without peace, so that we live our life without joy and that we, even if we go to heaven, that we will at most be tormented and as though we live in hell on this earth. He wants to make our life hell. Now it's one thing to be persecuted, go through hardships. It's another thing when inside of your world, your heart, your mind is penetrated, filled with deep darkness, with deep confusion and with deep anxiety and depression. The Bible makes it very clear that in 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan has devices. He has weapons fashioned against you. He wants to take you out. He really has two main goals. Number one is to get you as far from Jesus as possible. Number two is if you get to Jesus, to not allow you to serve Jesus fully, to restrict, limit, and hinder your service to the Lord. And so, all of these other tactics like demonization, intrusive thoughts and all of that are really all fall under these two main purposes of satanic intrusion and demonic intrusion into the life of both believers and unbelievers. 
is to keep us from Jesus, number one. And number two is when we get to Jesus, to keep us not serving, following Jesus. He wants to destroy your spiritual life and then He wants to restrict your spiritual service. But today the enemy is going to be defeated and we are going to be victorious through Jesus Christ in Jesus name. If you're more than a conqueror in Christ, I want you to drop number one in the chat. Show your participation in God's promise of setting us free. Jesus wants us to be free. He wants us to be victorious and He wants us to be triumphant. He wants us to go from dominion, from deliverance to dominion, from freedom to victory. What I'm going to do right now is expose or show, pull the curtain a little bit on the plan of the enemy. The illustration that I'm going to use today will come from the book of Acts chapter 12. It will come from the story of Herod, James and Peter. And Peter's imprisonment, I'm going to use that as an analogy today to how Satan binds, imprisons and also brings destruction in people's lives. Also how Peter broke out of that prison, we will see some practical steps of how you can receive deliverance, freedom and walk in your destiny as a Christian. If you are ready, drop this in the chat. I am ready. Now, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, now about that time, Herod stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. The first thing that I want you to see is Herod, like Satan, wants to harass the church. Herod is like the devil. He doesn't necessarily focus so much on unbelievers because they're already going with him to the lake of fire. They're already living in opposition to Jesus. So he wants to harass the church. He wants to harass believers. That's why people who say things like, oh, Christians cannot have demons. Christians cannot be attacked by demons. Demons are only attacking unbelievers. Demons are only targeting unbelievers. Like they kind of miss the point is that, you know, if you're playing a game of football, you typically will be attacking the opposite team, not your team. Satan has a very well-structured kingdom and he is in opposition to Jesus' kingdom. And we as part of the church happen to be on the opposite side. We are not on the same team. And so his target will be us. This is not to scare us. This is not to give us nightmares or to live with an expectation of demonic assaults and attacks. But this is to honestly wake up and realize you are a target. And that's good because that means you're not on his team. To be a target of hell, the devil and demons shows that you're not on his turf. You're the opposite. You're not part of darkness anymore. You're part of light. I would rather be an, a living fish that swims against the current than a dead one that swims with it. And so Herod harassed the church. Do you feel harassed today? Do you feel like you're being attacked? Do you feel like there's some kind of a, an assault, a pressure? Do you feel like there's this weight that's coming in that's just more spiritual than physical? Could it be that it's not because you're not serving Jesus enough, praying enough, fasting enough, but maybe it's because you are. Sometimes you can be doing the right things and experiencing a pushback. Why? Because you are on Jesus' team. Herod was attacking the church. The second thing that I want you to see that was happening here is that he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Satan sometimes succeeds in killing others, hurting others, including believers. Sometimes he succeeds temporarily in afflicting, affecting, dominating even our own lives for a season. We know people who are Christians who take their life. We know Christians who live in depression. We know Christians who are experiencing 
oppression of Satan through his demons. And that could be because the enemy does have some success. Yes, he was defeated on the cross, but it does not mean that he never succeeds at what he does. And maybe he has succeeded in your life up to this point. Maybe he has ran a rampant in your family tree, in your bloodline. Maybe he has caused affliction. He has caused destruction and stealing in your life. Today, something's going to change. I want you to notice the third thing about Herod and our enemy, and that is this. When he succeeded with James, he got momentum. And he didn't want to stop. He actually started on Peter. The Bible says he chose to seize Peter. And it was during the days of unleavened bread, Acts chapter 12 and verse 3. Satan is just like Herod. The moment he gets a momentum, he doesn't stop. He doesn't want to stop. But something happened. What stopped, I believe, the plans of Herod is the church started to pray. Instead of taking the beating, they started to fight back. I don't know if they prayed when James was taken, but they did start to pray when Peter was taken. Now, this, this story physically is was speaking of persecution and God supernaturally sometimes intervened. Not all the time. But I'm applying that today to our spiritual life. If you're letting the enemy steal, kill and destroy, and you're not creating an opposition, a fight back, taking back your territory, he will keep on doing that. He is not gonna stop. Drop this in the chat, and this is not a positive confession, but the devil does not stop until he gets stopped. I'm going to say that again. The devil does not stop until he gets stopped. Someone has to stop him. The Bible says, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee. He doesn't run until somebody opposes him, until somebody rises up and says, enough is enough. You can't go any further. We are not going to allow you. I draw the line. You tormented my family long enough. You tormented my mind long enough. You tormented me long enough. Get out. I resist you. I rebuke you. I stand against you. This is my territory. My life belongs to Jesus. And devil and all of your demons. You can't do this anymore. You have to stop him. Somebody drop this in the chat. Enough is enough. And sometimes what we do is that we think that the devil will get tired. Sometimes we think he'll find another target to harass and he'll just move on. He doesn't. He does not move on. He does not get weary or tired. You have to stop him. And the church started to pray. And when they did, something just broke. Something just changed. But I want us to go a little bit further. So we've noticed that the enemy wants to harass Christians. Sometimes he succeeds in controlling, influencing, oppressing. He doesn't know how to stop. He has to be stopped. But I want us to go to number four. And that is this. We see that Herod arrested Peter. He put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So I want us to see a few things here. One of them is the chains, so arrest, the prison, soldiers. So let's look over some of these tactics that the enemy uses. Number one, we see or the, the fourth thing in our teaching, one, two, three, four. So the fourth thing in our teaching that Satan does is that he has soldiers. Herod had soldiers to do his bidding and Satan has demons. So mostly when we say that the devil is attacking me, we actually don't mean that the actual devil, because he's not omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent. 
He can only be in one place at one time. So he accomplishes his purpose like Herod did. He didn't actually go physically bind Peter. He had soldiers who did his bidding. And the devil does most of his work through a very well-structured kingdom, very well-oiled machine that is ran by demons. These demons, they are spirits without bodies who desire to inhabit a body. We don't know for sure how they came about. The traditional Christian teaching says that they fell from heaven with Satan. Some argue that they are the, the spirits of disembodied Nephilims. But whatever it is, whatever they came from, one thing is very certain. They have an insatiable passion to inhabit a body. Their preference is a human body. But they sometimes settle for the body of an animal. These demons, they are bent on doing Satan's bidding. They are given assignments by Satan. Some demons have assignments to afflict the health of a person. Some have the assignment to afflict the mind of a person. Some demons take on the nature of their assignment. That's why when you ask them, what is your name? They will begin to say their name as is connected to their assignment. Demons usually come into a person's life and there is the gate demon that opens the doors for other demons. The, the, the demon of bitterness will open the door to the demons of murder, to the demons of hate. Uh, one demon wants to always open the door for another demon. Why? So that they can have more and more occupation and oppression in person's life. That's why when you see Jesus casting demons out, many times you would see them saying, don't cast us out, meaning there was more than one. Satan accomplishes his purpose through demons. These demons, they want to inhabit and harass a person. They are destined to go to the lake of fire. They cannot change. Mercy and grace is never offered to them. And I've met people who say that they feel sorry for demons. I don't. God doesn't. And nor should we. They are vile. They are vicious. And they are determined to accomplish their task set to them by their boss, the devil. The reason they do not like to leave a person is because they also get penalized for failing their assignment. Sometimes even during deliverance, demons will scream out and say that I do not want to leave because they'll face judgment, not only from God, but they face some, some sort of consequences uh, for failing their assignment. And so because the same way we see that Herod was punishing soldiers who let Peter slip through their fingers or through them uh, because of supernatural intervention and then they received consequences. So I've seen not once and not twice where demons would um, beg and plead not to leave because they knew that that would mean that they failed. And so, but I am completely fine and okay with demons failing because I want to have them fail so that we can succeed. We live so demons fail so that their assignments fail because no weapon formed against us will prosper, meaning somebody's going to fail. And I don't want it to be you. I don't want it to be me. I want it to be demons. They will burn in lake of fire for eternity. But before they get there, they need to also experience defeat and failure because you chose to rise up and you chose to do something about their involvement in your life. Drop this in the chat. Demons must fail and I must succeed through Jesus, through His authority in my life. Now, the fifth thing that we're learning about the enemy, we're learning this from Herod and that is this. Herod kept Peter in a prison. So he had guards that took the work of Herod, his plans. But the place where he kept them was in prison. Now, what Satan does, he uses demons, but there's one more thing that he uses that I call it a prison, is curses. The devil 
not only uses demons to harass people, the devil also locks people in prisons of a curse. Curse is like a prison. It holds you, you know, there are slaves and there are prisoners. Slaves are people who are free, but they're not free, meaning free that they are on the outside, but they have somebody that owns them, controls them. Prisoners are people who are not owned in a, in a sense, but they are so restricted and they are limited. They still live, they still eat. Sometimes some prisoners even offer medical help. They have certain um, books they can read. Some prisons allow some form of even entertainment. People can watch some movies, but they are extremely restricted. So Satan wants to use demons to harass people. But something else happens also is a curse. Now curses and demons slightly different. <laughs> curse started in the garden. It was actually God's way of punishing humanity for disobeying His words. The first pronouncer of the curse wasn't Satan. It was God. When men disobeyed God, God cursed the ground and then God cursed the childbearing and then God cursed the snake. Then we see God says, whoever curses Abraham gets cursed. God says, whoever disobeys my word gets cursed. We see that these curses, they're not only something that the devil invents, is that something happens in the spiritual world when you violate God's will, when you do what's not pleasing to Him, something begins to happen. As you go into this spiritual prison, it's like this cloud that follows your life. And demons use those curses as open doors to begin to harass. It's almost like God lifts the protection from a person and says, listen, you don't want to be under the umbrella of my covering. You're stepping out into the storm, the tornado on your own. And there are deadly consequences from that. Demons use curses. We see the prisoners. Peter was a prisoner. He stayed in the prison connected to other soldiers. Many people who come who have demons also have curses. They have generational curses are the most common curses. And when a demon is cast out, those curses are broken. A person can live as though they are free from prison, free from jail. They can live longer because the curse sometimes manifests in a few ways. You, you live very short life. Now, Jesus lived a short life. That wasn't a sign of a curse. But if everyone in the family dies prematurely, that could be a sign of a curse. Reoccurring constant chronic diseases could be a sign of a curse. Usually it's generational. Constant attacks on your mind could be a sign of a curse. Barrenness, infertility, and problem with reproductive organs could be a sign of a curse. Broken in the family unit, brokenness in the family unit and relationships could be a sign of a curse. Reoccurring constant lack and financial shortage could be a sign of a curse. Accident prone, meaning you're experiencing weird, bizarre, unexplainable, reoccurring accidents. Falling from the ladder, breaking your leg, getting car, car accidents every quarter. Just things, just they're accidents. You didn't plan for them. It wasn't your, uh, you, you were not sloppy. You were not uh, just lazy. This just stuff happens to you and you're tracking your life and you're noticing this has been happening in my family. And that could be a curse. Somebody in the family tree offended God so much, perhaps in being involved with the occult, perhaps being involved with witchcraft, that what it did is they stepped out of the protection and the umbrella of God's protection and they stepped on the territory of a curse. Curse becomes a spiritual prison that demons take advantage of and they together with those curses harass your life. You're living with this place 
this this cloud that follows you, this chain that that, that connects you, this prison. You you have certain amount of freedom, but you can't go very far. And then you come to Jesus, and the Bible says that through Christ, we can experience freedom from those curses, and we can experience freedom from those demons. Now it's another teaching. Does it happen right away when you become a Christian? There are groups of people who believe that the moment you're a Christian, everything is wiped out. No more curses, no more demons, no more pain, no more wounds, no more past, which is legally true. Positionally, it's 100% true. You're a new creation. But on a practical level, you have to still continue to resist, fight not to get that victory, but from the position of that victory. Israel received the promised land in Abraham. God gave Abraham the promised land, but Israel didn't possess the promised land until they fought for it. And many Christians, what they do is they live in these prisons and they live with these chains and these prisoners, these um, soldiers that are binding them. And they're just simply say, well, I prayed a prayer, but my life didn't change. Nothing changed. Well, something did change. You became a new creation. But we do have to teach you how to also fight. Because Paul tells us, Peter tells us, Christ tells us to trample upon snakes, resist the devil, walk in faith. That means that there is a part we have to play to see that these promises become evident in our life. So let's keep going. Let's review. Herod is like the devil. He wants to harass Christians. Herod is like the devil. Sometimes he succeeds in hurting us. Herod is like the devil. He won't stop until he is stopped. Herod is like the devil. He has soldiers who do his bidding and devil has demons. Herod is like the devil. He has prisons where he keeps his prisoners and the devil has curses. Let's go to sixth thing and that is Herod has chains that holds his prisoners connected to his prisons. So I want you to notice he has soldiers, he has prisons, but there's one more thing and that is chains. Look what he did to Peter. He put him in the prison, delivered him there. I want you to see the church was praying and we see that when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound, bound with two chains between two soldiers and guards before the door were keeping the prison. This is like an imaginary an imagery of spiritual warfare. We see that there are guards. I call them the guarding demons, the, the strong men. Those are demons usually that usually open the doors for other demons. They're guards and they control so that you don't go anywhere. Then we see that there are soldiers. Those are the ones closely connected to Peter. We see there's a prison and we see there's a chain that connects all of that. See, Satan isn't just interested to cause you to have demons harass you. Curses that keep going from one family tree to another, from one um, generation to another. He has these strongman demons, meaning these guard demons, the ones that open the doors for demonic garbage to begin to come in. But do you think if that's not enough? He has one more thing and this has been a common thing with a lot of people. He wants us to develop chains, addictions. He uses addictions also to get us connected and deeply grounded in His kingdom. Addictions to different things, they become Satan's way to keep you grounded, planted in the prison of generational curses. Look at people who have generational curses. Look at people who are demonized. You'll probably see something else that they have is a habit that's not holy, a cycle, a chain, a repeated way, the way they live, the way they do different things. It could be in the form of pornography. It could be in the form of drugs. It could be in the form of painkillers, addiction to painkillers. It could be in the form of something else where it's not holy or it's not godly. Because the enemy wants to keep you anchored in his kingdom, he draw you into his kingdom, 
keep you restricted. I call them grave clothes. When Lazarus came out of the tomb, he was resurrected. He was alive, but he was restricted with grave clothes. He was still Jesus' friend, but he was not free. And that's what the enemy wants to do, is he wants to bind you with grave clothes. It could be something you drink, something you look at, something you listen. It could be gambling. It could be some form of addiction. If you are addicted, you got company. If you are addicted, there is a chain that is connected to you and it takes that chain all the way to Satan himself. Even if it's something as cigarettes, something as vaping, something as, oh, I occasionally look at pornography. But what if it's not just occasionally? What if there is a chain that it keeps jerking you back, keeps pulling you back to that and the Lord wants to set you free? Prison, soldiers, guards, chain. Curses, demons, guard demons that open doors to other demons and addictions. Now, it doesn't end there because what I want you to see is when an angel of God comes, look what happens to Peter. When an angel of God comes there, the scripture says that Peter was sleeping and the light shone in the prison, which tells me not only there were chains, not only there were guards, not only there were soldiers, it was also dark. Herod has darkness that fills the jail. And the devil uses doubt, depression, and fear to keep his victims under his influence. As Herod had darkness that filled those prisons. So there's prisons, there are soldiers, there are guards, there are chains, and there's darkness. Satan wants to use curses, generational ones, cast curses as well. Curses where somebody pronounced them over you or you pronounced them over yourself. Satan also uses demons, beings that seek to possess or seek to own or inhabit, mainly inhabit a human body. Satan also uses addictions. And these addictions are the ones that keep us in the loop in that cycle of repeated sin. Satan has also guards. Guards are these strongman demons. These are also demons that could open doors to other demons, the entry point demons. And lastly is darkness. He loves to fill people's lives with depression, heaviness, doubt, confusion, so you don't see the light. And the thing what I want you to see is that there was a church that was praying. Peter was kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Today is that time. If you've been praying constantly, God is going to dispatch His Spirit his presence. As the church was praying, God was hearing and sending an answer. That answer comes in the form of the Holy Spirit. So number eight, what I want to highlight to you is this. There is a force against Satan and that force is a praying church. It's the praying mother. It's the praying father. Even if you're the one that's oppressed, your prayer matters. Your crying out to God matters because God delivers us from demons. He doesn't deliver us from our friends. God delivers us and we have to be desperate, not passive and not casual. If you are not desperate, deliverance, even if it comes to you, you won't embrace it. Drop this in the chat. Deliverance is for the desperate. Deliverance is for the desperate. The church was praying and I want you to notice what begins to happen after that. God sends an angel. Behold, 
An angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in his prison. And the ninth thing that we see, and that is this, is that Herod had a being who couldn't be stopped by chains, soldiers, darkness and prison. And that being we have as Christians today and it's the Holy Spirit. An angel couldn't be stopped by the guards, by the soldiers, by the darkness, by the prison, by none of that. He went right through that. The Holy Spirit is not intimidated. The Holy Spirit is not limited. And the Holy Spirit is not restricted by nothing. It does not matter how deep and how far you have fallen. How many guard soldiers are chained to you? The Holy Spirit is so much greater. For God has anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit, it says, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. But if I cast out demons, Jesus says, by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God, by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The Spirit of God is upon me, for He has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to open the prison doors and to proclaim to the prisoners the year of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is that angel today who's going to walk straight into your prison, who's going to walk straight into your chain, chains and darkness. You're being connected to all of these soldiers and He's going to start disconnecting you. He's going to start delivering you and setting you free in Jesus name. Drop number one, if you believe that the Holy Spirit is greater than any other spirit. Drop this in the chat. The Holy Spirit is greater than any spirit. He will conquer every spirit. And now let's take a look at how this deliverance happened to Peter. So the 10th thing that we're going to see is God's way of prison break. God's way of prison break. And I'm going to give you just a very practical one, two, three, four, five, six things that happened to Peter that I believe begins to happen to us even as we experience deliverance in Jesus' mighty name. I believe the Lord wants to bring a prison break spiritual breakthrough in your life. Somebody drop this in the chat. I'm ready for breakthrough. For God to break me out of my situation. For God to break me out out of my problem and my suffering. Now let's go into this chapter and we see in Acts chapter 12 verse 7. And behold the angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shown in the prison. The first thing that God does is He lights up the room. Lights up the room. Prison had darkness. First thing Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit will do is light up your life. What does that mean? There comes hope, there comes faith, and there comes understanding. Light is always symbolic of knowledge of enlightenment and darkness is symbolic of ignorance. When you begin to recognize that what you're fighting is spiritual, light comes up. I remember when I was battling with pornography and I was fighting shadow boxing, trying to discipline something that was demonic. Nothing wrong with discipline, we need more discipline. But when the light came up, I remember that this this truth came up. I am not dealing with the flesh only. I'm dealing with the Spirit. Light came on. Ignorance was gone. And now I was better equipped for the next thing that was coming. So God wants to light up your mind. Remove the confusion. Remove the ignorance. And remove this lie that, oh, this is just natural. This is just normal because some of us have believed that our circumstances, that the repeated cycle of things that are on the other, other person will look at it and say, that's not normal. And we have normalized demonization. When God wants us to live in the light, 
but we don't normalize torment, don't normalize demonization. And to do that, there has to be light. When you watch videos like mine, when you read content like my break free book, a light begins to come up. Oh wow, I didn't think about that this could be that. And the Holy Spirit begins to light up your darkness first. The angel lit up room. The second thing I want you to see that happened there is he struck Peter on the side. So Peter was sleeping. We see that a verse before that night Peter was sleeping. So the second thing that the angel does and I believe the Spirit of God will do is wake us up. Drop this in the chat. Wake up. The first thing is light up. Second one is wake up. As long as you're spiritually sleeping, you're not going to get out from the prison and be freed. Sometimes when God's Spirit comes, you know, the torments and the sufferings and the demonic attacks, they could make you passive, make you feel like you're a victim, make you feel like you can't fight. There's nothing you can do about it. But when God gives you His light, then the angel hit Peter and Peter woke up. His eyes were open. God wants to wake you up spiritually. He wants to wake up a soldier in you. He wants to wake up your passion, wake up your prayer, wake up your consecra consecration and concentration on Him. He wants to wake you up. And I've seen this happen when people are demonized. They get sick and tired. The light comes up. I can be free. This is not normal. And then they wake up. You can see them pressing in in prayer. You can see them fasting. And that's what some of you are doing right now. You, you woke up. There's a lot of woke Christians, but God wants to wake up Christians. Spiritually wake them up so that we begin to press into Jesus. And some of us are alive, breathing, but just sleeping. I call them slumbering saints, sleeping saints. They're not moving anywhere. They're not active, but they're alive. Got the heartbeat, but I am not um, moving. No momentum in my life. I'm just alive. Rise up wake up, light up, wake up. Now the third thing I want you to see that happened to Peter and I believe the Lord wants to do it to you and He says, arise quickly. So God's way of prison break is light up, wake up and the third thing is rise up. Rise up, while wake up means man I gotta do something, rise up is I'm gonna do something. I'm going to right now believe for my deliverance. I'm going to go for deliverance service. I'm going to sign up for the deliverance course. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to go do something about it. I'm going to press into Jesus today. In just a few moments, we're going to pray and I'm going to believe that today is going to be my day. I'm not just woke up and I'm just watching this passively. No, I'm going to get engaged and I'm going to rise up. But once you notice the fourth thing that the angel tells him to do, and that is gird yourself and tie your sandals. Dress up, light up, wake up, rise up, dress up. You got to put on the righteousness of God. You got to put on the armor of God. You got to put on Christ. You don't put on your demonization. If you want to overcome the demonic attacks, that means you got to put on the armor of God. Go into the battle, even for your deliverance, with an attitude. Greater is He that is in me than the one that's in the world. I belong to Christ. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of preparation, the peace of the gospel. I am dressed up. 
not dressed down. I don't dress to the level of my circumstances, my feelings and my mood. I dress up to the level of God's promise, God's word and who Jesus is. And this is about to get crazy. This is about, I'm about to experience victory. I'm about to experience breakthrough. And Jesus lit up. He woke me up. Jesus rose me up. And Jesus tells me to dress up. He doesn't dress up Peter. He tells Peter to dress up. You have a role to play to put on the armor of God. But I want you to notice what happens after that. And so he did. He says, put your garment and follow me. In verse 9, so he went out and followed him. Went out and followed him. And he did not know whether it was real or not. In verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate and lead the least to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately angel departed from him. Now, so we said the first thing that we must do is light up. The second thing we must do is wake up. The third thing is rise up. The fourth thing is dress up. And the fifth thing is get out get out now these are the practical things i'm going to pray for you in just a moment so i believe that there are things that are going to be broken and loosed but these are the practical things you and i must do get out represents walk away from the place that had you bound walk away from the habits that had you changed chained walk away from the place of trauma walk away from the place of addiction walk away from toxic places and toxic people get out from that prison. Connections with people. Fellowships that we have. That at this season of your life are only dragging you back to your past life. Walk away from that. Get out. No, but Jesus, I want you to set me free right here. I'll be in prison. Could you bring me some pillows and food and I'm going to stay here. God, could you bring the milk and honey into Egypt? Jesus, I don't want to get out from the, from the grave. Could you come into the tomb and get all of my grave clothes off of me? That's not how that works. God says to Israel, get out of Egypt. Jesus tells Lazarus, come out of the grave. The scripture tells us to come out from among them and be separate. Meaning there is a role that we have to pray, play. Is that we draw the line and we say, I'm getting out of this. I'm getting out of this. Not only mentally I am putting on the armor of God, but practically which things in my life I have to quickly leave right now and walk away from. I'm getting out of this. For some of you, if you're struggling with vaping and you're receiving this message, you need to take those things and throw them away. If you have pain meds that are no longer for your pain, but now they're addicted, you need to flash them down the toilet. For some of you, if you are experiencing right now, you're an addic addict to alcohol, take that alcohol and pour it out and get, get rid of that. You got those drugs, you're like, no, but I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna use them, I'm just gonna sell them. No, flash them down, down the toilet, get out of that. If you are in a relationship and it's sexual, the person doesn't want to marry, you know it's wrong, get out of that. Either you draw the line and say, hey, we can't be living together. This is not just about, I can't tell you how many people come up for prayer for deliverance, but they're not willing to move one finger. They're not willing to move one inch. They were not willing to do anything to get out of that situation. In fact, they hope for God to do all the work and then when He gets them done, gets that work done, then everything will be sorted out. That is not how deliverance works. You got to get out. You got to get out of those circumstances. You got to right away draw the line. Hey, I'm not going to be involved in that. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's the fifth thing. And the sixth thing is the angel leaves him. And I want you to notice what happened. Is that Peter had come to himself and says, Now I know for certain the Lord has sent an angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and all the people and all the expectation of the Jewish people. Verse 12. This is amazing. When he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark where they were gathered together praying. Hmm. So light up, wake up, rise up, dress up, get out. And the last thing is get into the house. Get in to God's house. You got to move from deliverance 
to discipleship. You got to move from deliverance to community. You got to get out of the cursing of your house, the one that you're running from, generational curses into generational blessings of God's house. Get into the house. He knocks on the door. The girl freaks out. She doesn't let him in. Peter doesn't leave and gets offended and say, oh, they didn't welcome me. I didn't feel connected. I've been going there for four months. Pastor still didn't shake my hand. The church is too big or the church is too small. No, Peter waited until she knocked again, until he knocked again and she let them in and he comes in and something begins to happen is that Peter found safety because Herod was still hunting him. Herod was still looking for him, but Peter found safety, not in prison, but in the house with other believers. So to experience this spiritual prison break, as God's angel brought that to Peter, God's Spirit wants to bring it to you. He wants to light up your world. He wants to wake you up spiritually. He wants to rise you up in authority. He wants to dress you up in His armor. He wants you to get out from the to toxic sinful situation and He wants you to get into His house. Deliverance is to make demons homeless, not to make Christians homeless. Every Christian needs to have a spiritual home. Can somebody say Amen? Drop this in the chat. Deliverance is to make demons homeless, not Christians homeless. In Jesus' name. And I want you to notice what begins to happen. The last thing is Herod gets struck by an angel for not giving God the glory. And the devil one day will be bound by an angel in the book of Revelation. And then we see 12th lesson from this, Herod gets eaten by worms and the devil along with his demons will be burned up in a lake of fire where worms do not die. Mmm, I can't wait for that. It's going to be good. Where worms will not die. So let's review this and we're going to go into prayer. Herod is like the devil, wants to harass the church. Herod is like the devil. He wants to succeed in killing, stealing and destroying. Herod is like the enemy, the devil. He doesn't stop until he gets stopped. Herod, like the devil, has soldiers who do his bidding and the devil has demons that do his work. Herod is like the devil. He has prisons where he keeps his prisoners and the devil uses curses, generational curses, cast curses. Herod, like the devil, holds his prisoners in prison. The devil uses addictions. Herod, like the devil, fills those prisons with darkness. The devil fills people with doubt, depression and fear. Herod has only one force against him and that is spirit-filled praying church. Herod has a being that can oppose him, stop him and it cannot be limited by chains, soldiers, darkness or prison and that was an angel. For us, that's the Holy Spirit. God has a way of breaking prisoners out by lighting things up, waking them up, rising them up, asking them to dress up, get out and then get into the house. And the end of Herod is what's going to happen one day to Satan. He will get struck, bound by an angel for not giving God the glory. And he will be thrown into the lake of fire where fire will not die and worms will not die. And just like Herod was eaten by worms, devil and demons will spend the lake of fire all their eternity because they oppose Jesus and His plan. Come on somebody and drop that fire emoji if you're excited for the future. I always say if the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. He's going to get eaten by worms. He's not going to die. He's going to live forever in torment. You will live forever for Jesus. Amen. Now we've come to a time where we want to pray for people that are needing deliverance. I'm going to ask you today to surrender your life to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, ask Him to come into your heart right now. He's your only deliverer. Just right there, say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I repent of my sin. 
if you are living in a known sin with someone or doing things right now, just, just repent. No, you don't have to feel a burning sensation all over your head and God doesn't have to zap you or hit you. His Word is already convicting you. Repent of that sin and make a decision right now that you are not going to take part in that sin, but you're going to walk away from that sin in Jesus' name. If you do have things in your possession that are demonic or not, they're not good, they're sinful, destroy them today. Get out from that place. Get rid of those things. If you have unforgiveness towards someone that hurt you, forgive them right now. Just say, Lord, I forgive this person. Lord, I, I release unforgiveness. I release bitterness. I release that to you, Lord. I do not want to be a bitter, offended, and unforgiving person. I forgive that person that hurt me. In Jesus' name. And right now, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see people that are forgiving those that hurt them. You see people that are repenting of their sin. You see people that are confessing you as Lord and Savior. And right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, I take authority over every unclean spirit that is harassing and tormenting God's people. In Jesus' mighty name, I commend every unclean demonic spirit to come up and out right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I commend those demons that are tormenting God's people to leave right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Every demon of witchcraft, sorcery and divination and that enter through occultic involvement come up and out right now in the name of Jesus. Every unclean spirit that is tied to ungodly soul tie and immoral relationship. I commend you to leave right now in the name of Jesus. Come up and out right now. Holy Ghost fire in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost fire on your kingdom. Holy Ghost fire on your works right now. And those unclean spirits leave right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I commend every demon that is hiding behind those generational curses spoken and unspoken on both sides of the family going back to 10 generations in the name of Jesus Christ leave right now come out right now in the name of Jesus every spirit of hatred every spirit of anger every spirit of resentment every spirit of revenge every spirit of retaliation and unforgiveness and bitterness in the name of Jesus Christ leave right now when I mention a spirit that You've noticed that it's attacking your life. You just drop in the chat out in Jesus name. Out in Jesus mighty name. I commend all demons of addiction, drugs and alcohol, legal or illegal, that keep God's people bounded. In the name of Jesus Christ, out right now. Out in the name of Jesus. Out in the mighty name of Jesus. All unclean spirits of pride, in Jesus' mighty name, I take authority over you right now. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' mighty name. I take authority right now over every unclean spirit of pride. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' mighty name. Every unclean spirit of haughtiness, arrogance, vanity, ego, disobedience, and rebellion. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost, fire right now. Out in Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit of envy, jealousy, covetousness, out in Jesus' name. Come on, drop this in the chat. Out in Jesus' name. Every spirit of fear, unbelief, and doubt, out in Jesus' mighty name. I commend every spirit of lust and perversion, immorality, uncleanness, impurity, adultery, fornication, pornography, and any sexual repeated sin, out in Jesus' mighty name. I break every curse. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, every false promise, oath, or obligation in connection to some kind of a demonic institution, in Jesus' mighty name, be broken. I break right now every connection, known or unknown, that you have to Masonic Lodge. Any secret society oath made by you or your ancestors to be rendered powerless in Jesus' mighty name. We lift every curse, sickness, and demon that resulted of the, from the evil of Freemasonry. 
In Jesus' name, this evil is broken right now and it cannot continue to attack you and your family in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Ghost, fire in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I come against every generational curse right now. For those of you that are battling with generational curse right now, drop that fire emoji. We're going to come against every generational curse in the mighty name of Jesus Christ right now. Holy Ghost, fire right now in Jesus' mighty name. I come against every curse that causes premature death that runs in the family. Come out right now in the name of Jesus. I come, I come against every curse that runs in the family that causes nervous breakdown, anxiety attacks, hopelessness, depression, inability to control your thoughts, emotions and desires. I command you to go in the mighty name of Jesus. Come out right now. Generational curse of nervous breakdown. I break every generational curse that manifests itself in chronic disease. Every spirit of infirmity, deformity, pain, arthritis, allergies of all kinds, fevers, all kinds of respiratory problems, sinus trouble, infections, cancer, tumor, ulcers, eczema, acne, hernia, blindness, all kinds of eye trouble, paralysis, all kinds of trouble with ears, glaucoma, deafness, all kinds of spirits of bone breaker and back breaker come out in Jesus' name. Generational curse of chronic disease be broken right now. Come on, drop this in the chat. Out in Jesus' name. Take a deep breath and breathe it out right now. Receive freedom right now in the name of Jesus. I break every generational curse of family family breakup. Spirit of divorce, adultery, fornication, perversion, constant fighting be removed in Jesus' name. The breakdown of a family unit. That generational curse will be broken right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Every demon behind that right now be uprooted, come up and out in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Ghost, fire in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, drop this in the chat. Out in Jesus' mighty name. I come against every generational curse of infertility. Every spirit behind low count sperm, barrenness, miscarriage, fibroids be gone in Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit that is behind reproductive organs that runs in the family. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over you and by the light, the fire of God, I command you to leave right now out in Jesus' mighty name. I come against every generational curse of poverty. Any demon behind constant lack of finances, spirit of mammon, greed and materialism be loosed and gone in Jesus' name. Constant shortage, troubles at work and in your finances. Out in Jesus' name. That curse be broken right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I break every generational curse of accidents. Every demon behind car accidents constant injuries be gone in Jesus' name. Accident prone. We cancel that curse right now. We break its grip over your life right now in the name of Jesus. Be free in Jesus' mighty name. I come against every generational curse of death, premature death, every spirit of death, murder, epilepsy, self-mutilation, abortion, abnormal grief, mourning and sorrow and convulsions. In the name of Jesus, come out right now. Come on, drop this in the chat. Out in Jesus' name. Out in the mighty name of Jesus. Out by the power of the Holy Ghost. Be uprooted right now. I break your grip right now. Be loosed right now from this person and go to the pit, you unclean spirit of death. It ends with us now in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Ghost, fire in the mighty name of Jesus. Out in Jesus' name. Out in Jesus' mighty name. Out in the mighty name of Jesus. Out in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Out in the mighty name of Jesus.
every spirit spouse, out in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, fire in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody drop this in the chat, say, I'll receive. Let's take a deep breath and just breathe it out right now. Just breathe it out. Be free in Jesus' name. Be free in the mighty name of Jesus. 